attention, please. My name's Eleanor Hamilton, and you've probably never heard of me. But if you ever go to London, you've probably heard my voice on the underground. This is Covent Garden. You've probably also heard my husband, Phil. This is a platform alteration. Though he's mostly famous for saying three little words. Mind the gap. As far as I know, we're the only married couple guiding people to their destinations on the transport network. And as far as I know, we've never had an argument over which train you need to catch. Well, not over the tannoy anyway. Over 14 years of marriage, we've had our fair share of squabbles off mic, which is all perfectly normal. But what I suppose sets us apart from most married couples who work together all day every day is that one of us is still alive and the other is dead. In this series of podcasts, I'm going to be talking to a number of famous voices, people who speak to you every day and who are just as human as the rest of us, even though you might not have heard their names or even seen their faces. They might be telling you your call can't be taken at the moment. They might be behind a famous catchphrase on a TV commercial. They might tell you what the weather's going to be like through your phone or smart speaker. These aren't automated voices. They're real people with real stories. And they're a huge part of the soundtrack to all our lives. And in some cases, they even live in our houses or in our pockets. But we don't even know them. So I'm going to tell their tales from the tannoy. I obviously can't interview myself. And my husband is a little bit indisposed these days. So, in this first episode, to help me tell my story, I've enlisted the help of two friends, Debbie Mack and Stephanie Hurst. So, it was really quick then. Kind of, what, the, the, the marriage or the, the career? <laughs> <laughs> both. <laughs> both, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah careers I, can go in that way, can't they? they can. so, and, and relationships. Yeah. Because he'd been divorced twice before, um, there weren't any venues left in Bolton that he hadn't been married in before. <laughs> So we ended up having a marquee in the back garden. And it wasn't a massive back garden. It was just big enough for a marquee. So, you know, all our friends sort of tramped through the house and into this marquee. And it, and it was great. You know, it was, it was dead casual. It was it was a bit unconventional. It kind of reflected us as a couple. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so it was, it was a nice, it was a good day. And then, you know, yeah, graduated, had two babies, you know, always the higher achiever, right? pop them out at once yeah. um and <laughs> <laughs> sideways um and yeah and, and the uh, the day after I gave birth I think the contract came through to provide the tube announcements and we'd been talking to them for months and months I mean these things Amazing. rattle on for ages yeah, yeah yeah um Phil had been the voice of British Rail I think for a long time he was the most apologetic man in Britain because he apologized for everybody's yeah. train being late <laughs> and I think that through that they'd found us and needed a man and a woman and so they, they came to us and we, we we negotiated with them and it looked like the job wasn't going to happen for whatever mm. reason I think another studio had got it at the 11th hour literally as I'd given birth Phil came into the hospital waving this purchase order and I was like oh my god <laughs> okay and I can't remember exactly how many stations there are on the underground but say for example it's 2000 and I had to read each single station name it's not that many but each single station name with an upward inflection and a downward inflection yeah and I, quite often I was actually feeding a baby I was say we two, oh two young babies as yeah. well yeah I just oh. used to go down into the, the our home studio and literally put a baby on my boob and <laughs> crack on but they get people to where they need to be so that's yeah okay. yeah that's the main thing i was down in london a couple of weeks ago and obviously went on the london underground heard your voice a lot and next time i go to london now i'll be thinking did she voice that with a baby on her boob that's, that's all i'm gonna be thinking <laughs> it kind of takes us down the avenue of of boobs oh yes we, we like talking about boobs after losing fell mm-hmm. you then have your own cancer battle yeah when Phil was dying, I noticed a lump in my left breast and I didn't say anything. And I also just thought, well, it can't be anything. But I couldn't have possibly told Phil because he had enough to think about. Mm. And why worry him? You know, he, he didn't need to. There was nothing that he could have done. In this episode, I'm going to talk to the voice inside your sat-nav. Please take the first exit at the roundabout onto the A322. John Briggs is a journalist, broadcaster and voiceover artist who's probably best known as the original voice of Siri. Yes, I'm a civil celebrant, so it is about the celebration of the the life that has gone, um, mm. whereas a vicar will tend to conduct a service based on their, their thoughts, their own personal view of the afterlife, mm-hmm. and a humanist at the other end will do a service based on you know um, their view of the planet and our place in nature and so on. And the, the mantra that I have all the way throughout, and I talk to this, and I include this sometimes in my committals, is you know everything that they did remains done. Everything that you learnt from them remains learnt. Everyone that they loved remains loved. 
that doesn't turn off. That doesn't stop just because they're not on the planet anymore. And I, I mean this in the gentlest and nicest way possible. None of us have a right to live to be very old. None of us. And we live in a world where we turn to the medical professions and go, you know, well, it's your fault. You should make me live until I'm 90. Mm -hmm. um, actually, you should be living a life as if there's a possibility you might drop off the twig tomorrow. I'm going to talk to the calm, assured voice of ITN News. This is ITV News at 10 with Tom Bradby. Gail Potter is a voice artist, actress, mum of twins, an all-round good egg. It was like living, waiting for a, a, an earthquake or a volcano that you knew was coming every day, but you didn't know when and you didn't know how bad it was going to be. So for me, my adrenal system learned to live in a fight-or-flight state. Right. And that is key to how my mental health and my physical health kind of became status quo, really. And then a disastrous first marriage when I was 23. Mm -hmm. We'd only known each other six months. And um, when I was in Panto, he ghosted me after about a year of marriage. If he was going to pick a time to leave, Panto, really? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Your kids are screaming, he's behind you. And I'm thinking, no, he fucking isn't. And I don't know <laughs> where he is. And I might just say my lines or I might just cry and tell you to all fuck off because my husband's disappeared and my life's falling apart. But I would have got sacked, so that wasn't an option. We meet the guy who's famous for saying things like this. In a world. And this. Coming soon. And this. Out now. And now, even this. You're listening to Tales from the Tannoy with Eleanor Hamilton. Red Pepper. So anyway, I went home and the phone started ringing again and he called me in and he says, um, I don't mind telling you now because this is 26 years ago. Mm. He said, um, I'd like to offer you um, 600 pounds and you come in for one hour per week. One hour. Wow. I love the way the man's dizzy. He's, he's, he's lost the plot. Are you serious? 600? I was working 48 hours for 320 yeah. quid in my head. I'm about 600 quid? That's Monopoly money. Anyway, I said, okay, I'll think about it. I'll get back to you. I'll talk to my people. I didn't have no people. But my, my father always <laughs> taught me, seriously, my dad always taught me, Never take an offer. Take what you want, not what they give you. And I said, okay. Yeah, very wise advice. Believe me, but I'm playing Billy Big Nuts now, and I'm giving it large on the phone. Listen, uh, yeah, about that 600 pound, you know, I got a family. I'm a young man. I got kids growing up. You offer me 600 pounds for a two-year contract. Come on now, you need to bump it up. And he says, well, take it or leave it. I said, oh, no messing. I said, I, I, all right, I, I'll take it. The voice featured in this episode is the silky smooth lady who follows you around supermarkets and department stores telling you what offers are on this week. As does Good and Balanced Range. Find them in the chilled ready meal aisle today. She's everywhere, hiding in plain sight, but she can't always tell you where. Katie Moore. From a standing start, basically, I, I had been to drama school and I thought I was going to finally be an actress. I did a bit of telly, did some repertory theatre, it was all good. But I married my then boyfriend and had two children quite quickly afterwards because he was a bit older than me, mm -hmm. like 16 years older than me, a bit like your film. Well, and, um, you're at amateur level, I'm afraid. It was 25 <laughs> years between us, but, you know, oh, it's healthy. not a competition. Yes. <laughs> basically, I just thought I'd be putting my acting on hold for a while. Mm -hmm. I certainly wouldn't be doing any theatre, but I'd be doing bits of telly, the classic, The Bill, Holby City. Did you spend a lot of time on trolleys and casualty? I mean, the television casualty, uh, not the oh, real casualty. Dear God, love, no, I was a psychiatrist. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. Excellent. I wasn't a sick person. No, it's a bit like upstairs, downstairs. I was up. I wasn't down. No. I should think so too. I used to be in advertising and my husband was uh, a media buyer. So I was kind of aware of what he was doing mm. work-wise. Uh, he was in London until 9-11 and then he decided he wanted to be at home more so. And he, so he brought his experience of advertising to, to the West Country. Right. And so one day, very suddenly, he went out on his motorbike and was um, hit by a car and died instantly. He, he broke his neck, I think. I didn't know too many details. I was told best not to know. Mm. <laughs> wow. So it was one of those things where you just sort of, I'll oh, see you later, I've cooked lunch, you know, come back for Sunday lunch. And literally I never saw him again. Mm. 